Credo che se nella prima parte del nostro convegno abbiamo ascoltato direttamente dai giovani con qualche suggerimento che cosa eh, si aspettano nei confronti del lavoro, adesso è la parte di costruire uno scenario su quella che è la nuova economia, quelle che sono le nuove frontiere, ciò che si può immaginare eh, per un mondo diverso, sostenibile. Sapete che ci sono due grandi documenti che in questo momento stanno, ci stanno guidando, da una parte c'è cioè l'agenda ONU 2030 per uno sviluppo sostenibile, propone 17 target da raggiungere entro il 2030 e dall'altra parte c'è questo grande documento che Papa Francesco ha lasciato a, a tutte le persone, non soltanto i clienti, che l'hanno dato sì. Il problema è che è urgente mettere mano al pianeta in ottica di sostenibilità perché sembra che si stiano avverando per terribili previsioni che nel 1972 il Club di Roma eh, fece sul futuro del pianeta, indicò una serie di trend a partire dall'inquinamento, dalla crescita della popolazione e così via e ahimè al 2000, indicando nel 2030 l'anno in cui avremmo avuto le maggiori criticità al punto di non ritorno in cui la situazione sarebbe diventata insostenibile. La cosa terribile è che eh, ci sta, ci hanno, finora ci hanno azzeccato, quindi hanno azzeccato perfettamente la forma delle curve e la tendenza verso il punto di rottura. Quindi sarà molto interessante sentire eh, la relazione eh, di Zoom Kinkel sulla struttura di Tommy. Credo che adesso si va a un video. Scusate l'introduzione, ho chiesto permesso al dottor Zoom Kinkel se potevo dire anche che lui è un generoso, un generosissimo benefattore delle opere di Don Bosco qui in Italia, e praticamente un altro specialissimo ha fatto delle, delle belle realizzazioni nella nostra opera di Este e recentemente di Schio. Eh, lui è molto sensibile soprattutto agli aspetti appunto della formazione dei giovani e dei giovani delle scuole professionali. Scusate, mi sono villanamente dimenticato di dire che il professor Coffele, oltre che un grande docente e un collaboratore della comunità a San Marco, è anche il vice rettore emerito dell'Università Pontificia Salesiana da cui lo ripetiamo. gioia trovarmi oggi qui con voi. Scusate se io non posso parlare bene la vostra bella lingua. <laughs> Today I will speak about the circular economy referring to my new book. Let me first present to you three theses on the circular economy. And later you will see a nice film too. My first thesis is, <clears throat> if we keep running our economy the way we have been doing it for the past 100 years, the economy and our whole planet will blow up. I will share you some thoughts about this. My second thesis is, are there better alternatives? And I believe, yes, there are many, like the circular economy. And finally, my third thesis, is it okay? Can you hear me there? Or are you already sleeping in the last room? Not really? So my third thesis is, can we, as individuals or organizations, do something about it? Yes, we can do a lot. I will give you some example from my work at the Foundation and from my uh, company Deutsche Post DHL. This is the largest logistics company in the world 
with over 520,000 employees in every country in the world, and there I was CEO for 20 years. <coughs> now to the first series. If we don't change the way we run our economy, planet Earth will blow up on us. Let's start by first celebrating. Barack Obama asked in, an, in a speech which time period from the last 500 years people would choose to live in. Maybe some of you think the Medici time in Florence, or maybe today, or maybe in Rome 2,000 years ago. He speculated that they would opt for now, to live now. And they are probably right. In 1990, the size of the global economy was 23 trillion euros. In 2015, only 25 years later, the global economy tripled, 78 million. In 1990, 1 1.9 billion people were living in extreme poverty. Now the number had been cut by more than half to 830 million. And most citizens of advanced economies today command goods and services that were beyond the reach of even kings only 200 years ago. And here is what my generation and your generation can be really proud of. More than 80% of all wealth in the last 1,000 years, 80% of all the wealth in the last 1,000 years was created between the years 1950 and 2000. But we also know that our understanding of growth is based on a lack of understanding. Permanent growth with an exponent greater than one would lead to explosive growth. So it's impossible. Mathematically, growth must always alternate between stagnation and decline. Let us start with resources. <clears throat> what happens to the national, natural resources of our planet with this growth? Let me give you just some facts. Water. We see rivers like the Rio Grande or the Yellow River that stop reaching the sea. Saudi Arabia's groundwater will exhaust it in 25 years. They have too many golf courses there. <laughs> Much of the groundwater in Punjab, India, which made the population explosion in India possible, has been used up. India's green revolution was built on credit and on 21 million deep wells that are now running dry. And without water, you cannot harvest anything. Soils. <clears throat> what do you think? How long with current trends of erosion and degradation will our global soils last? The answer is a very short one. Our global soils will last only 60 years. And additionally, as you know, the population of our planet will increase from 7 billion to 11 billion in 2100. And we have only one planet with only one soil. Now to climate. You are more familiar with that. With respect to climate, we are currently on track to CO2 concentration levels between 600 to 700 ppm, way above the so-called climate safety threshold. And we already are seeing real change, like in the Arctic or in the oceans. I am living part of my time in the Trentino, and there the air is still very fresh. 
<laughs> and they have, if I remember correctly, 30% of the territory in the Trentino are protected by one way or the other behind Italy. Okay? So uh, they are protected. So on climate change, we could talk about this for a whole weekend. But believe me, this is the greatest danger to our planet and to humankind. Let me go to oceans. According to the FAO, over 80% of fish, fish stocks are overexploited or fully exploited. And we are polluting the sea. I'm currently supporting uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in the United Kingdom, which is running a large project on plastic in the ocean. In 10 years' time, there will be one kilogram of plastic to every three kilograms of fish. Plastics are invading the food chain. And besides the climate change, it is another big threat. <coughs> when we uh, presented the findings at the World Economic Forum in Davos, this was the most click page at the, uh, at the back. So, our growth is a borrowed growth. We are borrowing natural capital. We are massively borrowing from the planet. In fact, we have started a bank run in businessman terms on our natural resources. And what <clears throat> Does the story of natural capital say about our growth engine? We are starting to understand the effects of natural depletion. The inclusive wealth index, for example, is a measure of natural capital depletion. If you ask me, that is the GDP of the future, because it does not measure the increase in GDP, which is bought for all the economies, I learned that at the university, but I think the future is with the Inclusive Wealth Index, where the total stock of manufactured social and natural capital is measured. In other words, it tells us how wealthy we are. Once we measure it, we are really better. It's a real surprise. We are growing poor. Out of 140 countries, 82 have decreased their inclusive wealth index over the last 20 years. So we think we are growing. Even in Italy, we are growing in GDP. But in effect, we are growing poor because we are using the water, the soil, the air. And as human beings, we need a lot today but essentially, we need air, something to eat from the soil, and to drink the water. Now you ask, maybe ask yourself, why do we, with all this wonderful growth, you know, 1%, 5%, China 7%, other countries even 9 or 10, why do we use the resources of our planet so rapidly? rapidly in this obviously unsustainable pace. And I can tell you it's a waste. We are producing and then we are throwing it away. We started, my foundation started analyzing the economic waste in our system. We did two big projects for the European Commission. And we started in some of the most mature, optimized sectors where you would expect to find little remaining waste. We looked at mobility, cars, etc., food, slow food, fast food, fast food, and housing. They account for 55% of household spending and 80% of resource use. That's it. Take mobility. Well, think for 10 seconds 
how much time a normal car in Europe is used? 100%? 50%? A European car is parked 92% of the time. 1% of the time it is sitting in congestion. And when the car is used, only 1.5 <coughs> of its five seats are occupied. Therefore, the shared economy, economy is one of the key factors for success in the future. The debt weight ratio often reaches 12 to 1, especially the SUVs in the United States. They turn out a lot of steel and then one wooden be. 20% of the total petroleum energy is translated into kinetic energy, etc., etc. And if you look in a big city, I'm also living in London, I mean, 50% of inner city land is devoted to roads and parking spaces. 50%. And the rest is for children, living, universities. And the rest is for cars. We have to change it. I mean, you are the new generation. You have to change it. My generation is producing still all the cars. Take food. A full 31% of European food goes to waste along the value chain. Fruits and vegetables lose as much as 46%, etc. Take buildings. In the built environment, the average European office is used only 40% of the time. Only used 40%, the rest empty. And the demolition waste accounts for 30% of total waste in Europe. Economy as a whole, lifetime of any manufactured product, from a plastic bottle to an Airbus, is nine years. The average lifetime of a plastic bottle up to an Airbus is nine years. At the end of the cycle, what do we do? We throw it away. 95% of the material and energy value is lost. And material uh, recycling and waste-based economy recovery capture only 5% of the original raw <coughs> material. And on top of it, you use the asset is utilized only 50%. You know. After McDonald's, we throw all the packages away. Yeah. And uh, a good car is used maybe 15 years. You can only say, what a waste. So, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it was a little horror trip, but now I'm optimistic. <laughs> As an as an entrepreneur, you have to be optimistic. Otherwise, you cannot work and you cannot motivate people. I think also as a professor, as a teacher, you have to be optimistic. And I also believe that Don Bosco was really an optimistic uh, thinker. Now for the second thesis. Are there better alternatives than just to keep going? Yes, there are many. And as I say, a picture is worth a thousand words. I will stop speaking and I would therefore like to show you a film of my co-author and friend Martin Stuchtai. Recently he produced, we produced that for a big event in London. So now we need the first. la proiezione di questo film che riprende molte delle tematiche che ha presentato nella sua relazione il professor il dottor Zumpinkel ed è anche sottotitolato sotto in italiano la relazione la chiederemo e la, fare, la renderemo disponibile Three minutes, uh, ladies and gentlemen 
speaking about my third seat thesis. Can we as individuals, can we as people in organizations do something about this threat? My thesis is we can do a lot. And just let me give you some examples of the work of my foundation and of the work of uh, my company, Deutsche Post DHL. We, under the umbrella of the Deutsche Post Foundation, we have three institutes. One is the Institute of Labor Economics. And we know a lot about the labor market in Italy, too, you know. 40% of the young uh, unemployed. In Germany, only 6% because of so many reasons, but that's another speech. Then we have an institute on behavioral economics and inequality. Inequality is rising in the world. And some, the Institute for Environmental Economics. And all the work on the circular economy is run by the Sun Institute. We did, uh, our first project was a comprehensive study for the European Commission. The goal was to firmly anchor the circular economy in the, in the EU. The project was done by McKinsey and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We were only giving the money at some sorts. Yeah. The main report is called Growth Within. A circular economic, economic vision for a competitive Europe. And a <coughs> follow up report is called Achieving Growth Within a 320 billion euro circular economy investment opportunity available in Europe. This has been and still is a great success in Brussels. Let me give you a taste of what three commissioners said at our last conference. First, a quote by Vela, the EU Commissioner of Environment. Quote, I'm very impressed by the findings of the Growth Within Report, looking forward to developing our shared agenda. They're now putting it into the regulations and many of them. Then by Katainen, the EU Vice President, Jobs, Growth, Investment and Competitiveness, that's his title, he said, Circular economy will be a similar mega trend in the economy as globalization. And I believe that. I'm convinced, he said, that the circular economy can enable a tri triple win economic, environmental, and social. And third, by Franz Timmermans, EU Commissioner's first vice president, he said, I passionately believe in the opportunities of the circular economy. The future is not making things with finite components. I mean, there are the three top lights there. Okay, there's one up there even. <clears throat> and not only the environment commissioner. I mean, the commissioner is doing the real work in the market fields, in the economic field. The second example is our support for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in the UK. They are very successful. They are just concentrating on circular economy. And they just started a year ago uh, the work on the, on the plastic in the ocean, and it's all over. Well, maybe one more, ex two more examples. We. Uh, we founded a company, Systemi, this friend of mine, and, and two others. Uh, and they are in London, and within 80 months, as a startup, they have now 100 people. They are the McKinsey in the environment field, and they are doing consulting work and investments in, uh, in the environment protection space. For example, a big project, uh, reforestation in Indonesia, and we are their strategic capital partners with others. And one of my partners is George Soros. And then we do a lot of work for the United Nations. We have a 
multi-year project for UN environment. It's like the Ministry for Environment uh, for the world, so to say. And there is an international resource panel. Maybe you have never heard of that resource panel. You may have heard of the climate panel, the guys with the two degrees Celsius. But there's another panel. There are 50 the top scientists of the world, researchers researching on the resources of our planet, like water, soil, phosphate, etc. And we report them with a strategy, etc. They were just accepted in Lima in Peru. And so on. Final example from my company, Deutsche Post. Now I'm retired. You know, I have a successor. Therefore, I have time to stay here. <laughs> so this company, very big. Every day, 1,000 planes are flying over the planet. There are more than 100,000 cars, and they do a lot of good stuff. Yeah? And we worked a lot. And during my time, I tried to convince the German car manufacturers, you know, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Audi, BMW. I tried to convince them 20 years ago to build electric cars for a fleet of the Poles. You know, in Germany, I think we have 50,000 cars, you know, they go out of the door, they come back, you know exactly what they are doing. It's wonderful to have an electric vehicle. But they said, well, we are not so really interested. We, we want to sell you at Deutsche Post DHL our cars. Yeah? And it's too early and it's not uh, economic, etc. So I was not successful to convince them. And then we went to a University of Aachen. That's a big Technology engineering university is the best one, I think, in Germany. And we made a startup with three professors. And they built first something on the computer, then they built a model. And then we built a small, uh, not a factory, a smaller one of a factory. And they built an electric vehicle for our letter carriers, parcel guys, express guys, driving around. And it was so successful. So now we have 5,000 electric vehicles on the, on the roads. That's already 10%. And naturally our advertising guys, they are really saying we are the best ones. Yeah? And now we are building a second factory. And now others are buying these electric cars from the Deutsche Post. So you can really do it. Yeah. And the objective is that uh, in uh, 2025, 70% 70 of the delivery is emission free worldwide. In New York, in London, in Berlin, with our company. Yeah. And then we think we have also a great advantage. So, I could tell you a lot of other examples, but let me conclude my three thesis. If you continue to run the economy like over the past 100 years, the economy and the planet will blow up on us. Are there better alternatives? Yes, I think. <laughs> especially in the third economy. And the third one, can you, as an individual, every day, every week, next year, better today, <laughs> or as an organization, as a university, or as a company, can you do something? And yes, you can do a lot. You can build an economy that creates growth and a sustainability. Thank you for your attention.